I think uh, it looks like the numbers have slowed down. So it looks like most people are in. I don't want to waste any time. So we'll officially get started. Um, but, but feel free to keep having those side conversations in the chat. Uh, so welcome, good afternoon. I'm Marcy Calabretta Cancelvello, Intern Coordinator uh, for Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Welcome to our 17th annual festival, but it is our first virtual festival. Uh, today's craft talks are featuring David Baker and Vivi Francis. I'm very excited to see both of them speak. Um, David Baker's craft talk is titled Subtlety and the Sublime, and Vivi Francis's craft talk is called The Personal Eye, why and how our lives matter in the poem. Each poet will discuss poetic craft for 30 minutes, followed by an audience Q&A uh, via the chat session. So make sure you drop those questions in the chat, uh, sorry, in the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, handouts for this craft talk with David Baker will be dropped in the chat and also screen shared. There is no handout for Vivi Francis. Um, as always, you have the chat uh, for your virtual reactions and engagements. Say hello to each other, um, drop your own comments and responses. Before we officially begin, I would like to thank our founder and president, Miles Kuhn, and his wife, Mimi, our sponsors, Morgan Stanley, the Legacy Group of Atlanta, Gladstone Multimedia, and the Cultural Cent Council of Palm Beach County, Visit Florida, Murder on the Beach Bookstore, the National Endowment for the Arts, and all of our other sponsors and supporters, as well as to all of you for attending. David Baker will speak first, and then Vivi Francis will speak second, and then we'll have our, our Q&A. Um, thanks also to our chat monitor, Abby Nover. Thank you again for coming this afternoon, virtually joining us from all over. David and Vivi will also be signing books right after this. We'll drop the, the information in the Zoom chat as well. It will be a different a Zoom link, so be on the lookout for that. You'll definitely want to pick up their books. If you if you didn't before, as soon as they're done speaking today, I'm sure you're going to want to get at least one or two of their books. Um, anyone listening interested in listening to participants in the David Baker workshop uh, or the workshop with Lauren Bossalar and Tracy Brimhall, um, we are going to be launching our YouTube playlist, uh, our first playlist actually, at four o'clock via our, our Palm Beach Poetry Festival YouTube channel. Um, and tonight at eight o'clock is our special Thomas Lux Memorial Reading featuring Gregory Orr's performing uh, his beloved poetry and song cycle with the amazing Parkington Sisters. Uh, so you'll want to catch that as well. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to David Baker. Please give a round of virtual applause. Hi, everybody. I'm going to tread water for about 15 seconds here and ask you if you have it available to find the handout that I've put together for you. There are seven pages. There it is right there. And we're gonna immediately need um, the first page, the first poem. That's just fantastic. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I always wanna begin and end with the poem. Not the lesson, not the meaning, not the craft element, and certainly not the theory. The poem, this is In Passing by Stanley Plumley. On the Canadian side, we're standing far enough away, the falls look like photography, the roar a radio. In the real rain, so vertical it fuses with the air, the boat below us is starting for the caves. Everyone on deck is dressed in black, braced for weather and crossing against the current of the river. They seem lost in the gorged dimensions of the place, thin in fog in a moment, gone. In the Chekhov story, the lovers live in a cloud above the sheer witness of a valley. They call it circumstance. They look up at the open wing of the sky or they look down into the future Death is a power like any other pull of the earth. The people in the rain gear with the cameras want to see it from the inside, from behind, from the dark, looking into the light. They want to take its picture, give it size. How much easier to get lost in the gradations of a large and yellow leaf, drifting its goodbye 
down one side of the gorge. There is almost nothing that does not signal loneliness, then loveliness, then something connecting all we will become. All around us, the luminous passage of the air, the flat, wet gold of the leaves. I will never love you more than at this moment, here in October, the new rain rising slowly from the river. So we can shut the um, hand out. There you go. Thank you, Marcy. I won't catalog all my gratitudes right now to Miles and Susan and Jennifer and Marcy and our angel Haley, everybody else, especially my workshop companions, my cohort um, this afternoon, Vivi. But just to say, I'm in awe of you all. Awe is part of my subject today. I'm going to talk about subtlety and the sublime in lyric poetry. And let's be clear right now, there's nothing subtle about the sublime. That's my first conundrum. So let's just call it irony for now. The sublime is nothing if not oversized, overstuffed, and so overwhelming. Why do that? I'm going to focus on this single poem by Stan Plumley, but I'm going to float outward and back again, changing perspective and dimensions, just like the poem does. Stanley Plumley was one of my dearest friends. He died April 11, 2019. Later this week in my favorite poem, Quickie Talk, I'm going to look at a little poem by another beloved poet and friend, W.S. Merwin, who died fewer than four weeks before Stan on March 15, 2019. I should note the poet Linda Gregg died five days after William on March 20, 2019. It was the worst of times until 2020. I'm gonna talk about the sublime and love and death, but is the sublime an element of craft? This is a craft talk. The sublime doesn't seem as mechanical as nuts and bolts as, say, the line break or quantitative syllabic meter, but it is absolutely tactical. It is a rhetorical choice a poet makes. So it is one of the fundamental formalizations of a poem. Absolutely syllabics is a formal craft choice. So is rhetoric. What I'm talking about here is actually how to read a poem how a poem finds its meaning in the tiny local touches and effects, but how those tiny local things may, in the hands of a fine poet, point to larger and more connected things. How do we read a poem, but also how might a poem read back its own context? Why would you ever write a poem about Niagara Falls? What is cliched more than that, more trite, overworn, sentimental, obvious? You'd beg your students not to go there in a poem. But here we are in Stanley's poem, looking over the edge. And as soon as I say that, I trigger a craft element, and that is both setting and context. What is the context, the meta setting, for these images, this set of formal choices, this tone, the story, even the structure, and it is the sublime. What is the sublime? Think of what you know. Think of those great massive paintings. Um, maybe we could have the handout again on the second page. Um, in those paintings, a landscape, tall mountains, waterfalls, sunshine coming down in fingers through the clouds, hugeness, I know this is black and white and they're tiny, but you get the point. Um, and if there are people at all, they are tiny and off to the center. And they are like we are just looking, gazing in awe. It is also thus a landscape of interiority. Think of Longinus, Keats, Wordsworth, Shelley, Whitman, in American painting, the Hudson River School, Thomas Cole, Asher Durand, Albert Bierstadt in Europe, Caspar David Frederick, or the Brits like Constable and Turner, who were so dear to Mr. Plumley. The sublime depicts a massive exterior natural dimensionality that measures a psychic space 
for condition. I have given you copies here of two paintings. I know they're hard to see. This is by Bierstadt and Cole. The paintings are massive. Um, the, um, well, actually, let's take a look, flip to the next page um, in the handout here at the first page of Wordsworth's Tentern Abbey. Um, I gave you a copy of Wordsworth's Tentern Abbey and a copy of Shelley's Mont Blanc as two of the, the sort of fundamental poems depicting the 19th century sublime. Um, at your leisure some other time, I guess that would be next week at the, at the earliest, you might want to go back through these poems and find the subject matter, find the context, all of which things Plumley echoes and adjusts in his poem. Go on to the next page uh, if you can. And I want you just to see the, the visual of this poem, how big and blocky the Wordsworth poem is. And likewise, if you'll take a look at the Shelley poem, similarly, um, in blank verse, in big unbroken blocks of um, print, as if we're looking at a tremendous risen edifice. Okay, we can do away with that now again. The sublime is a picture of nature, a variety of the pastoral poem. In fact, if you want to, um, later in the Q&A, we can talk more about some of those other varieties of the pastoral, like the Georgic and the Bucolic. The sublime is massive and thus leads directly to melodrama. In this, in my weird scheme, it is most like satire that is outsized, nearly cartoonish in its missized form and shape. Both satire and sublime arise at the end of the age of reason, the 18th century. That would be maybe hour three of the lecture to talk about that. So a couple of big observations, um, and then I wanna go back through Plumlee's poem. First question, why do we go there? Why do we go out to the edge? That's what the word sublime means. Sub limun is to mean to go up to the threshold, to step or raise high, to go to the very edge. That's what the word means. What is the appeal of the sublime? What draws us? What does it serve to do for us? You know, why do we get engaged there? propose there atop the Empire State Building or get married alongside the roaring Niagara, as Plumley calls it in his poem. Good Lord, what are we thinking? Point one, the sublime describes a temporal process, a narrative process, a two-part procedure. And it is, as Kant tells us, far different from the beautiful. It is about fear. First, sheer terror. Then it is about the restoration of stability, the promise of stable footing on firm earth. Think of those natural sights and overlook at the Grand Canyon, the Empire State Building, Mont Blanc, or as in the Plumley poem, Niagara Falls. It is both a sublime location and an erotic one. We go there and we think one thing, I could fly. What would it be like to take one more step or lean too far? I'm getting dizzy. Uh oh, my life would be over in five seconds, 10 seconds. But what knowledge would I learn in those seconds that can be learned in no other way? Freedom, flight, obliteration, Icarus. Knowing we could do that, contemplating that, means we know the chaos in the body and therefore in the heart. The desire to be rendered dizzy, crazy, ecstatic, which means out of our position, out of our stance, to be something else entirely from what we are. The desire to be flap, poof, gone. Then we step back or grab the rail and breathe. <sighs> that was a close one. 
the sublime. The pastoral is about ownership and ease and measurability. The sublime is about facing the annihilating beyond. Two, the shock of this poem, the Plumley poem, is felt in its measurability. The dizzying telescope in and out from the massive and collective to the minute and particular. Magnitude and a more human scale. Personalization and the impersonal. The conversion from the natural sublime in the Plumley poem to the elegy to the love poem. These things are indeed narrative and thematic, but they are also tactical and technical. Here's another way, a microscopic way. If you could pull that handout up again of the Plumley poem. Here's another way to see the poem's measurability. Do you guys have that handout? Here it comes. Thank you. To me, the ultimate achievement of this poem resides in stanza 10. If you'll count down. There is almost nothing that does not signal loneliness, then loveliness, then something connecting all we will become. Loneliness to loveliness. He changes one letter and everything transforms. The singular I becomes something we all become, which is to say the I is here absorbed or obliterated. That's genius at work. The whole poem lives in the shadow and the mist of that little bitty sublime transfiguration. So in just a minute, I'm gonna go back together through the poem and look at some more of Plumlee's craft choices or effects. Did Plumlee plan and intend these things? Were they part of his compositional scheme? Who will ever know? This is a poem about size. It keeps changing dimensions, huge to minute. Remember that little leaf? Microscopic to telescopic, exterior to interior, natural to literary, to human, descriptive, to elusive, to elegiac, to erotic. And remember again, those sizable chunky poems of Wordsworth and Shelley that you glanced at, those blank verse poems, that great big blocky form with hardly a white space, hardly a stanza to be found. The poems look imposing, great big sheer lofty, edifices of words. They are breathtaking in a literal way. And here Plumlee chooses instead to write in couplets, that most intimate of the stanza forms, the closely held stanza of two lovers. Plumlee makes his significant transitions between stanzas at first and then within stanzas, and then even within individual sentences. We'll look at that in just a second. It's stop and go. It's very insecure footing, a kind of dizzy procedure, a slippage of references and points of view. One step in the plural, the next in singular, one step in the near at hand, the next so far or into the mist. All the poem's details and images exist more deeply in the context of that narrative sublime. So go with me back through the poem. And I wanna, I wanna take about five minutes here and just look at a few of the signal details in this poem. In this poem called In Passing, which means on one hand, something that's merely going by incidentally. But when we pass, we also say um, that we have died, that we have passed. Everything that he does in this poem, he does in relation to the context of the sublime, its craft, the structure, the images, the point of view, the movements from the big to the little, the exterior to the interior. It starts in the plural on the Canadian side, we're standing far enough away the falls look like photography, the roar, a radio. We've begun with a visual, we're looking at the thing and not only looking at the thing, but looking at it as if it is a work of art, it is photography. And now it is a radio, a thing we hear in the plural. 
but stop immediately after the couplet. In the real rain, as if he's already underwriting the, the meta narrative part of the poem, in the real rain, so vertical, it fuses with the air. The boat below us is starting for the caves. So that's the first big transition. The next, everyone on deck is dressed in black, braced for weather and crossing against the current of the river. Another change in point of view. He's writing in the first person plural. Now he's writing in the third person. Are the, is the speaker on the boat with everyone else? Maybe not. They seem lost in the gorge dimensions of the place, then in fog in a moment gone. There's that hazy, sublime scene. But now the transition is going to break off. In the middle of the line, the stanza drops down and makes another kind of reference. The fourth gesture in the poem is an illusion. In the Chekhov story, the lovers live in a cloud above the sheer witness of a valley. Again, now they're looking. Um, it's very hard to figure out what that Chekhov story is. I never asked Stanley and I should have. I looked and looked and looked and I asked some buddies who should know. Uh, Michael Collier has been looking with me and Charlie Baxter and Joan Silber. And we all think it's probably the story called The Lady and the Dog, but we don't know. Charlie had a great way of saying that, well, I think that's what it is, but, he, but Stanley just translated Chekhov here into Plumley. I think that's right. They call it circumstance. They look up at the open wing of the sky that desire to fly, or they look down into the future. At this point, about halfway through the poem, I want you to notice the geometry of the poem. Everything built on that verticality, up and down. They look up into, they look down into the future. They look up into the open wing of the sky, as if measuring the dimensions of that, of that big sublime cliff. Now, Another transition, another breakage uh, from the integrity of the sublime, the first really big gesture that he makes. Death is a pull, death is a power like any other pull of the earth. That pull being gravity, right? The thing that causes us to fall. The people in the rain gear with the cameras want to see it from the inside. The first really intensely enjammed stanza from behind, from the dark, looking into the light, trying to gain purchase and a point of view into the sublime. They want to take its picture, give it size. How do we manage something that's too big for us? How much easier to get lost in the gradations of a large and yellow leaf drifting its goodbye down one side of the gorge? how much easier it is to manage something like this feeling um, by reducing its scale to a singular and small rather than to be overwhelmed by the scene of the sublime. Then his next big transition and his next huge statement, there is almost nothing that does not signal loneliness, then loveliness, I, I, I melt there every time, then something connecting all we will become. That movement is everything from loneliness to loveliness, from loss to beauty. The thing that connects us is the two of those things. And now he's preparing to exit the poem all around us, speaking now in the first person plural again. The luminous passage of the air, the flat wet gold of the leaves. And now settles even further into the singular and makes his final um, strong statement, I will never love you, line break, stanza break, more than at this moment, here in October, the new rain rising slowly from the river. Part of the power of that expression of love must be the result of not just the feeling toward that other person, but the setting itself. I will never be in a position to be able to say this to such power and with such feeling as I am now because we're here in this scene. And the only time in the poem when something goes back up, the new rain rising slowly from the river, the only time there is upward motion. That was my cat. 
you could think of that final motion, that final movement in the poem as uh, Stanley called it in an, in an essay, the intimate sublime. All right, um, some concluding remarks here. Um, all the poem's details and images exist more deeply in the context of the sublime narrative. But he shatters that illusion over and over, breaking the integrity of the romantic narrative. The footing is absolutely not secure and the movement is constant, as though the edifice were broken or jagged, as though the beautiful scene were somehow deconstructed and revisioned as another kind of poem, and then another kind of poem after that, a confessional, an elegy, a love poem, all of those uh, in pieces in this poem. At the ending of the poem, two things to say about the ending. All the movement in this poem is outward and downward as we look and scan over that vast terrain, then becomes inward and toward the end, upward, rising in a kind of eternal recurrence as even the processes of weather or condensation recur. One more thing about that ending, the pastoral and the sublime tend to be deeply unironic they tend to be profoundly sincere. And I have to tell you, I don't know how to hear the last sentence of this poem. How do you read that last sentence? I will never love you more than at this moment here in October, the new rain rising slowly from the river. On one hand, that's the declaration of great power. I love you so much. I will never love you more. But it's also potentially an expression of resignation I'll never be able to do this again. It will never be this good again. That is to say, not only here at the ending, but throughout the poem, Plumley speaks in a very beautiful melancholy voice, but with profound irony in a scene that's typically devoid of irony. If you read the Wordsworth poem, if you read the, uh, the uh, Shelley poem, Every single element of craft and tactic should or could depend on the context of the poem. Plumley's is a depiction of the sublime, but the belated, the contemporary sublime, the intimate sublime. And its meaning resides in large part on its relationship to what we know about the sublime prior to this moment. From the line and stanza to image to measurement of landscape as well as language, to tone to the narrative itself. The poem exists in its relation to this fundamental lyric genre. So here's the takeaway. Here's your homework. Here's the prompt. You ready? Do that. Okay, I'll say more about that. Here's what I mean. Think about the potential context of the draft of the poem that you're working on. Or start a poem with a deliberate intention to write in the context of such a genre. Pick another one, say the, the pastoral elegy. Or the political poem, the protest poem, whose context come down to us from the complaint, from the odic past. Say you're writing a letter poem Think about the epistles of John, the epistolary lyrics and odes of Horace, the 18th century frequent letter poems, the poems of Richard Hugo and Marilyn Hacker in their letter poems. Think about your context and argue with it. One last thing, if um, you would push to the final page of this handout, Just for fun, um, I've given you a starter bibliography if you would like to follow this up. Um, starter bibliography on the sublime. What I know of the sublime comes first from Longinus. You'll see that as the first listing here. 
Um, though we don't know a lot about Longinus and we're not even really sure who he is. Was he this guy in the fifth century AD? Was he this guy in the first century AD? We're not sure. Um, but his work uh, called either On Great Writing or On the Sublime is the source of much of what I'm talking about. So it gets picked up and rediscovered in the um, 18th century by Burke and Kant, um, just as the age of reason is turning into the romantic era. So here's Wordsworth and Coleridge um, and their preface to lyrical ballads where much of the romantic writing about the sublime happens. In America, the best source is Emerson's essay. Um, and then if you want to look at contemporary versions of the sublime. What does this all look like potentially now? There's a chapter in a book called Radiant Liar. And in that chapter are four essays. Um, I wrote one that's just about the history of the sublime, if you want to read that more. Linda Gregerson's uh, essay, The Gay Sublime, is magnificent. And here's Stanley's own essay, The Intimate Sublime, where he uses that term that I used, and Ann Townsend writing about the technological sublime pretty interesting. And then the most current thing that I could point you to is uh, a book and some work by a young theorist and poet, Joelle McSweeney. She has a book called The Necropastoral, makes the argument that nature is now a rotten carcass. If nature is ruined, what does that mean something like the sublime would look like? or love, or language, or beauty. Just a few things to follow up with some reading if you would um, care to do that. I am pleased to have had the chance to talk and mainly to talk about a poem by a friend of mine. I have chosen to do this so I'd have an occasion to read his poem to people. A poem from his book, Summer Celestial. It's a masterpiece. So thank you all, and I'm going to settle back and get my pen out and take some notes uh, from Vivi. And if you would like to talk some more, I'll be around um, in the Q&A session. Thank you all. Thank you, David, so much. And it's um, <clears throat> marvelous uh, being able to be here with you and um, every, everyone who's here from the panelists to the readers to the guests. Um, and uh, I really want to immediately uh, thank my workshop. You all have given me so much food for thought that I, I'm gonna be writing for days. And also you have overstimulated me so much. I don't know how I'm able to sit here and actually do this craft talk. I need to, I need to lay down <laughs> and just take everything in. So um, I'm going to give more uh, thank yous. Um, uh, the night of my reading, but um, Palm Beach, so happy, so happy to be here, so happy you asked me. You'll have to forgive me, I'm a little uh, rattled, a little uh, flustered and um, excited. I, uh, between workshop and now, I did watch the inauguration and it has me, uh, as my students say, shook, right? And I'm, I'm trying to, to process uh, all of the feelings that I'm going through, but I, I think that some of what I'm speaking of actually relates to uh, what we just saw. So I've altered a couple of things. I'm opening up uh, with three epigraphs. The first from Amanda Gorman, who we just heard uh, read poetry, so young and uh, so intense and so poised under such incredible pressure. I remember being that age. I did not possess those qualities. Um, I was reading her poem 
And this struck me, this uh, one particular question, how could catastrophe prevail over us? And today I'm considering to some extent catastrophe and the individual. Um, how do we approach that? And uh, what perhaps do we risk if we don't approach the personal and to some extent catastrophe? The second epigraph um, from Whitman, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And the final epigraph by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. So today I'm discussing um, the personal eye and uh, the mattering of our lives inside of poetry. I give a trigger warning because I give a trigger warning before every essay that, um, or lecture, essay that I read or uh, lecture that I give. This will be in 10 parts. Some will be easier to hear than others. Uh, some things may be surprising, um, but uh, I'll give you a prompt at the end and hopefully you'll be um, able to use some material here. It'll stretch us all. And I'm still working through some things. So I, I think that this will help me work through it too. One. We are so concerned that the I will lead to the confessional. We often say this without even stopping to consider what the school of confessionalism in American poetry meant at the time American poets first began using the term. We have lived with the ideas and gestures of the confessional widely discussed, lauded and lambasted since reviews of the seminal volume of poetry and lifestyles, we could bracket confessionalism in a history of American poetry from the late 1950s through the late 1960s. But disclosing the face of the poet, or indeed what the poet faces, behind the many veils that can obscure the actual face has certainly been made a more conscious project since that initially stunning period that saw several poets putting themselves at life altering risk by refusing to hide or refusing to hide as much. While we generally understand the term confession to mean the disclosure of something shameful or wrong, and it may seem as if many poets confess, I find that many more writers feel a distaste for personal disclosure in their work. Are the poets willing to speak about themselves? Sometimes, to some extent. Are they willing to reveal themselves? Yes, but the kind of disclosure that pushes back against accepted and expected cultural assumptions from the inside or the outside, not as much. These are the writers I really wish to speak to today. I have come to utilize and understand the value of personal disclosure in my work after years of writing persona poems. I did not start with my I, the I that I'm so attached to, the I that I am invested in. Though my I was always there, compelling me to imbue many of the speakers in my persona poems with aspects of my own personality. Howling Wolf, that's me. His guitar, that's me too. But I could not face my eye directly. I did not want to draw upon my own life, which I found to be painful. So I would cloak my eye in the position of 
I have a greater concern for the world. And I did, but I was also wounded and in denial, believing the pain of others was greater than my own, even as my own pain buckled my knees. Denial is a powerful drug. Two, use of the eye is cultural. I wanna say that again, use of the eye is cultural. When we speak of the eye, we are assuming that everyone is in agreement as to when and how we should use it, but that is not true. Some groups have more access to their personal eye than others. I'm considering Kundera's essay in which he discusses the provincialism of small and large nations. The small nation may insist upon a collective voice, whereas the larger nation may be able to afford the individualism of its citizens. Even so, where individualism is allowed, it carries its limitations. In the nation of poetry, try unseating the staid ideas of the muse. No, I mean it, really, try it. Try questioning the received beliefs of our field that are embedded in gender assumptions. Say that was embedded in gender assumptions and see how quickly you, the mouthy individual is dismissed. Discuss lineage outside of race or ethnicity. Confess your anguish over the received beliefs in our field and see how quickly people will try to bend your eye, bend your sense of self. Your poetry may be dismissed as political. Your lyrics become harder to hear, less musical, or perhaps people will say too musical. It took years for me to value the personal eye. It is of great amusement, bemusement, and sometimes anger that the same writers who avoid the personal eye in their poetry cannot stop noting every moment of their lives on social media. They want to be friended and followed and tagged. And when I question them about this, they inevitably say, oh, I only use it for poetry business or I've been meaning to get off of Facebook. Uh-huh. Can we just admit, my friends, that the impulse towards disclosure, to be known, to be understood, to be heard, to be seen, is a natural one, a human one, and a shared one. Three, several reasons are given by writers for their bent against confession. These reasons may depend, again, upon culture or gender. They may also depend upon region or the anxiety of influence and common but fallacious ideas around intellectualism, a false humility, defeatism, self-defeatism, fear, and perhaps most egregious, not understanding what is at stake when the personal I is erased. I'd like to address one or two of the reasons I just listed, if you will allow. My tendency is to offer up an anecdote or two to illustrate my points, personal stories. I like to play devil's advocate. So let's say I was asking you to confess. Let's say I asked you to allow more vulnerability in your work than you're accustomed to, to consider the deeply personal as powerful in the act of confession as inevitably political. So what? What if we do imbue our work with our own memories, our stories, our reality as we understand it? That's right, so what? Should we assume because the events which are ours secreted away inside the chambers of our hearts and if heart sounds too sentimental then say gut. Should we assume because the events which are ours secreted away inside our gut, the worlds that inhabit us literally revolving within, 
the miniature galaxies of experiences will explode from our rib cages if we reveal them? We tend to parse knowledge of ourselves out to those we believe will care or bitterly parse it out to those we believe won't. Relatives, friends, lovers, more to some, less to others, the generally trusted. We believe only those who care for us could possibly care about the varied aspects of our personal lives. We believe this so thoroughly that we are unable to discern the aspects of our experience that actually are relatable from those that are not. Perhaps this is why we wind up on Facebook spilling out everything, the detritus of every moment. On this note, there are two people in my life right now with utterly riveting memoirs. Every time they reveal parts of their story to me, I wanna sit down on a little mat in front of them, a piece of carpet, like a child at story time. I grow big eyed with wonder, and whenever I beg them to stop for just a moment, writing in other genres and commit to getting that story down in a memoir, they say, oh, that's not so much. Oh, that's not interesting. Mm. I'm pretty well respected. And I have the ear of one or two notable writers who call me for advice, who send me their work. But all discernment is lost in our fear of truer revelations. My saying, I really want to hear that story and that I need to hear that story has no impact. It is natural to feel one's own experience as suburban, pedestrian, common, but no one's life is so unnuanced. The question and challenge for writers is recognizing the complexities of our own lives, understanding our own impulses and relating them not for solipsistic affirmation, but for relatability to and for and through our readers. In other words, we must interrogate our own experience as humans if we want to lay claim on, to the experiences of others, even if that other is in the imagination. Without the ability to step back and view our own experiences within the web of the human frame and to value them, we end up, do, we end up with the opposite of humility. The humility we believe we'll have is learned and accepted and can lead to the hubris of, I write for those who are voiceless, or I write the stories of those people over there or the particularly insidious, the stories of others matters more than my own. So let me note here that everyone's story matters. And by story, I mean our set of life experiences as interpreted by us and lived by us, and that should be inscribed by us if we mean to investigate, analyze, and inscribe the lives of others. Are there eras in history when some stories must be put forward? Indeed, demand our engagement. Yes, and absolutely. And that's so important, I'm going to, to uh, read that again. Are there eras in history when some stories must be put forward, must indeed demand our engagement? Yes, and absolutely. Those of us who are 60 and under right now are particularly feeling the zeitgeist of this. Four. My dear friend, and this is no exaggeration, as my friend is dear because he and I have been placed together in some or extraordinary and rarefied situations that have sealed our connection to each other. Even when we fight, grow silent, take each other for granted, or grab hands in a moment when the world is too large for us. So I say again, my dear friend in all his foibles recently won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. He would identify
identify himself as black. So he has the mind to note the fluidity of such affirmations over time within African American culture. He is male. After the win, I was called by a newspaper. Um, a journalist from his hometown wanted to discuss what I thought his win meant. At the time, he was only the third black male to win the prize in its history and only the second for poetry. The conversation was moving along swimmingly with the journalist, happy, really overjoyed, so overjoyed I couldn't get a hold on my emotions, already being quite an emotional creature. Happy to be talking about this historical occasion. I was not expecting the question that I should have guessed would come. To paraphrase, quote, why does this book matter in light of the threats to black men and the deaths of so many by police brutality, end quote. Now this question rests upon some assumptions. The first being that if you are of a culture, particularly if you are non-white, since white has long been the publishing reading normative, then you are expected by American publishers and editors to write placing race forward. Now, and journalists placing race forward. Now, before you assume that this question was asked because the journalist was young and white and female, that's not the case. Let me quickly note this assumption moves across the cultural board. This is what is expected by almost everyone. Far too many over too many years. The assumption resting underneath that assumption is that work written by a particular group should easily reflect that group. And that assumption hides another, that what black is, is known. I would like to posit that what black is, is not known. Stay with me. That it is historically framed with all of the baggage that the word black holds, that the word African-American holds and discussed with a kind of hubris that makes me wince in its narrow measures, which have generally been urban and Northern since the Harlem Renaissance. But much of the work of those of African descent in the Americas and in the Caribbean is collective, not the personal I, but the we. So much so that I was leading a week long workshop at Oxford University a few summers ago for Callaloo and before me sat participants from all over the English speaking African diaspora, the US, the UK, Trinidad, Jamaica. And when I discussed using the I, by which I meant allowing for the personal I, the intimate story of self, will you forgive me? I just lost my page. Oh, this happens, doesn't it? Oh, one moment, let me see where it went. I'm very frustrated. I was just inside of it. Hmm. I do not know where my page went. Okay, I'm gonna pull it up again. Marcy, I should have sent this to you. Thinking that this might happen, I hit something with my thumb and lost it. Okay. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Forgive me, I'll start that sentence again. I was leading a week long workshop at Oxford University some summers ago for Callaloo. And before me sat participants from all over the English-speaking African diaspora, the US, the UK, Trinidad, Jamaica, 
And when I discussed using the I, by which I meant allowing for the personal I, the intimate story of self, those lovely participants began to cry. Some had never felt free to tell their own stories because of the prohibit prohibition of individualism in collective cultures or cultures where ideas around collectivism dominate so powerfully. So penetrating was the prohibition against the use of the personal eye that the thought of self caused feelings of guilt and shame and a sense that my story doesn't matter. Now this, this is not hubris. This was a genuine response to a set of values and teaching and received beliefs that I was questioning and insisting upon for the first time in their lives. African-American culture is largely collective. This is in part a protective measure to push back against forces so overwhelming and inherent that it is politically understood and often assumed without question that only a show of oneness can allow the kind of strength that can change law. This is also in part because of a history that stripped the self and ideas of selfhood so thoroughly that even considering it can now cause unconscious fear. Fear that we may act out of without even realizing that it's there. And that fear may show itself as an indifference to or denial of the importance of the personal story or that fear may be an adamant rejection of the personal I because I don't want to reveal myself to anyone or I don't want to reveal myself to everyone because it's too dangerous. Five, I am affectionate. I am round and soft for a reason by God. I have taken many into my arms and I have held many to say one thing, you have the right to tell your story your way. I am looking at all of you in my mind's eye. I can't actually see, but I'm looking at you and aching to hold my arms out. Six, I was furious with that reporter, but was it her fault? Any reporter from any background who was raised in America would have asked me the same damn thing. Perhaps any reporter in the world since America supports its assumptions. The reporter wanted to know how important was my friend's work given that the Black Lives Matters movement, to which I said, it is easier to harm someone you don't know. If Black Lives Matter, don't we want to take the time to know what those lives entail? And what better way to know what those lives entail than poetry? The details, the minutia, the grand moments, it's longings, it's forebodings. Gregory Pardlow's book Digest is just that. Less the ordered litany of a catalog than a kaleidoscope of considered moments, events, ideas, hopes, regrets that allow the reader to move into the speakers and speakers remarkably varied palette of life. The barrier between author and speaker in his poetry is a mere skein. It is the thinnest of membranes. And through our reading, we relate to that life, the individual's life in all of its associated complexities and nuances. In this way, our assumptions, our stereotypes, the things we bring to the text, unfiltered, are upturned. Pardo doesn't bend to common assumptions. He is a writer who dares see his own life within the larger web of human experiences. And he understands that once that life is so inscribed, it is no longer his own. And there's the paradox. Writers, it is not enough to look outward. It is essential, even if we do not use our personal stories to look inward. We must examine our lives to know what we may be dragging into our work inadvertently or to the reading of another's work. To understand and value our own moments allows us to be better able to see how another's moments might be valued. I said to the journalist, as I said to that class at Callaloo, 
To write only the external without attention to the internal is to write only the sum without attention to the parts, is to shake an empty gourd. To say Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter and know nothing about a Black life is empty. So what better text than one that braves its disclosures with assuredness and sometimes a devastating vulnerability powerful enough to make the reader rethink their own beliefs? How apt that we can read some of the poems as black text, but others not so readily. The work carries its cultural markers Brooklyn boy, indulgent father, family man, and all that implies, and far more. Seven, the poet Jack Riddle notes that though each story might differ in the details, we are all part of the collective of loneliness, pain, joy. That's where the relatability lies. So assuming no one cares about your personal story, your I is in some ways correct, but once the story is told again, it's no longer personal. It immediately becomes part of various collectives. In writing you as an individual, you may certainly be forwarded, but the reader will find themselves and they want to find themselves. They want to say, yes, I know. They want to say, hush now to the hurt child within themselves. They want to say, fuck you to the bastard that brought them pain. They want to say, love me and don't go. And I'm here and I am eight. Because our personal eye is taken to some extent upon the reading, we are indeed generous to allow it, brave to allow it. That is how the eye works, even the eye of the speaker in a persona poem, where the speaker is clearly not the author. See the collectivity as a set of shared human emotions that your eye will not prevent the reader from feeling, if you attend to your craft, but as we do not exist in a vacuum, may actually act as a bridge toward relatability. Nine, there is a reason the will to confess exists. It can be freeing, but only when the agency is ours. We alone must determine when and what and in what way or genre. And I want all of you to draw the corollaries. I may be speaking through the terms of blackness, but I think that we can draw the corollary in several ways. 10. So many students from the East Coast and Midwest, generally female, generally having had fine educations. And I say generally because in, I hear this more from women. So let me address that directly. Women who say, I don't use the I because it's not about me. I ask, okay, then who is it about? And if it's not about you, why not? And since poetry in America has in the main for most of its history been dominated by men, and since women have fought hard to add leaves to the table at which we sit, why on earth is it not about you? Why self erasure in a world that only recently acknowledged women at the table, just asking. So many students believe their work will be viewed through a keener intellectual lens. So many students want to be seen that way as intellectually keen. And we are all students of poetry. And it is easier to mask a fear of the self or a fear of the repercussions of revealing one's own experience through cold abstraction, through clever obfuscation, through, it was courageous to confess in the late 1950s early 1960s, late 1960s, and it is brave to confess now. Of course, little shocks us now, but I would like to suggest that sometimes we move toward the most shocking moments so no one asks what we are really hiding, behind what mask we are really having to face the events of our lives. We allow violence in our work to hide our wounding. We allow wounding to hide our rage. The real question is what is at stake if you are not there, if your eye is erased? What do you stand to lose? Who is telling you to lose your eye? And what do they stand to gain? Thank you. Now, 
before I, I'm going to say this, before I quickly forget, um, your prompt is uh, quite uh, simple. I want you to simply, in the next poem you write, allow yourself to be pushed even more. You're going to push yourself even more um, and reveal a part of yourself safely, but still allow a little more vulnerability. That's it. <laughs> Thank you both so much for those illuminating craft talks. Um, I'm sure people have many questions. We already have them piling in. Just a quick reminder to attendees that if you haven't already, drop a question in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll, uh, we'll share them with the authors. Um, so we'll kick off with the first one. Uh, this question is specifically for, for Vivi from Myra Walsh, or Moira Walsh, I'm sorry. How can I begin to perceive my own complexity if it's just regular life to me? There's no such thing as regular life. That, that's my answer. That, that's part of the key to stop thinking of it as, as regular life. My mother thought of herself as a regular person. She was so not a regular person. She would do the oddest, strangest things and they would infuriate me or delight me. I've never met a regular person. That's my answer. Thank you for that. Um, David, this, this question is from, for you from Armin Davudian. Both Wordsworth and Plumlee end their poems with an intimate address to a you, Wordsworth to his sister, Plumlee to a lover. Do you think this is just a coincidence or is it a common feature of the sublime poem? And are there other sublime poems that actually end in destruction rather than restoration? That's a whole bunch of good questions. <laughs> I don't know if I can summarize the sublime as a genre so much as to say it always ends this way or that way. The Shelley poem doesn't end with a, a, a another person there. Plumlee's ends as an erotic. Um, certainly Wordsworth's doesn't end as an erotic, but as a, as a gathering with his sister. Um, but he does personalize it. He does reduce the scale. Um, about destruction. Yeah, there, absolutely. Uh, Jory Graham has a poem called uh, What the End is For. Um, one of the most powerful poems I know in the last 30 years. It's about B-52s lined up on the field and as she imagines uh, this gr the grand scale of the landscape in, I don't remember, this, maybe it was in North Dakota and this massive landscape and these horribly destructive uh, bombers and the capability of these bombers rendered as a kind of sublime gone wrong. That's one of the best examples um, I can think of. I think I've got that title right. Do you know that one, Vivi? What the End is For? Is that the name of that one? I, I don't. As a matter of fact, I was just picking up my pen to write it down <laughs> and pick it up. So you I, caught me. I think, that's the, I think that's the title. It's in her book, uh, The End of Beauty. Um, and there's a way to read um, Middle Passage, um, Hayden's Middle Passage. Uh, Ooh. as a uh, horribly gone wrong sublime uh, that derives from the epic as well, I think. I'd, I'd, I'd have to go back and read that poem again, that long poem again really carefully and think about that. Thank you for, yeah. for answering that. Um, this question is, uh, is for Vivi. I'm gonna switch back and forth. Um, from Holly Wren Spalding, uh, who do you especially recommend we read besides well, you mentioned Pardlo uh, to further investigate the brave eye that you're describing? Um, it, it's funny because um, I, Pardlo doesn't know I've utilized him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know he's going to like that. But um, 
I utilize them specifically because no one else has called and asked me that kind of a question before regarding his work. So it, it just kind of flowed into this particular essay, but, um, oh, that is, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I've really, I see it so much. Um, okay, the way I'm gonna answer it is this. For uh, the first person I'd say is Ara D. Matthews. Although you're not, the I she uses there, she's using aspects of her life, right? But she's also writing the transgressive. So I'd, I'd say her uh, over here. And then over here, I'd say uh, Francine J. Harris, who is one of the fiercest writers I've ever read. Um, and uh, so these are writers I, I use in my, my classes often. Um, there's a new book out by um, Tommy Blount and it's on four way Fantasia for the man in blue. Um, it's so vulnerable that I have to read only a few poems at a time and put it down. And I blurred the book, I just, two poems at a time, put it down, two poems at a time, put it down because it, it, it just made me um, um, kind of quake inside, but it, it doesn't have to necessarily, I'm speaking both of personal experience and utilizing uh, the feelings that are kind of roil around after a particular event and then pouring that feeling into that speaker. So as opposed to this was the event, but this was the, the consequence. Thank you. And I think this is a follow up to that question from Richard Osler. Uh, would those, do you have one or two other poems that you would say best illustrate your prompt? Or do you feel that those would be those, the ones you would recommend for the same? Um, I think uh, those are the writers that are coming to the top of my head at the moment. However, um, I can send uh, you Marcy, um, uh, a list of poems. If you if you give me about twenty four hours, I'll go back into the back room and uh, look through the bookshelves. Actually, I just want to jump through the screen and look at David's bookshelves. <laughs> I'm just dying to know what's up there. So this is the poetry room. That, that's uh, that, those are those little bitty books of poems. Yeah, yeah. A great background for sure. Uh, so this question is for is for David from William May. In regards to that last line of the poem, "In Passing," is it is that duality present in Wordsworth and the Romantics in general? Concept of the sublime, the desire to grasp what is temporary, the dual meaning of of still as either stopped or ongoing, which is pointed toward the title. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I understood that question yet. Run that by me again. The, I'll read it again. <laughs> maybe look at the last line of the Plumley, which is, the, you know, the contradictory motion in the poem where things are going back up um, in Wordsworth, and especially in the Wordsworth. Um, or as I think about Whitman's Lilac Elegy, there's a lot of mist and a lot of hovering cloud and shroudedness, but there's not a lot of elevation uh, a lot of there's a lot of elevation but the the movement is a falling rather than a rising but that wasn't quite what that question asked uh, so the, i'll read it again uh, so in regards to that last line in the poem in passing is that duality present in wordsworth's concept of the sublime uh, as well as in the romantics in general um, I think that the, the desire to grasp what is temporary the dual meaning of still as either stopped or ongoing, which is pointed toward in the title? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I, I do know that in the Wordsworth, um, the impulses that are contrary to the sublime are historical impulses, but they are things he wants to transcend and can't rather than um, desires to, to transcend. Um, that, that is to say, in the, back, in the back of the Wordsworth poem is the French Revolution. That's the horribleness that he refers to several times in the poem, but just barely. He's just come back from a continent and he's seen um, 
the the destruction and that's the thing that keeps bringing him back to earth though he has this desire and it's much a much more romantic desire than Plumley. there's there's a huge degree of disbelief in Plumley uh, that um, Wordsworth doesn't manage. Wordsworth believes in that transcendent, uh, even beyond or through the ravages of history. Um, and we know better, <laughs> or we know different, right? Uh, it's, you can't transcend history. Thank you. Uh, so this question is for Vivi uh, from Kimberly Rose. What questions can we ask ourselves about work to dig deeper and go for the more personal I? Please share more ways to challenge ourselves. And thank you, I needed this. I'm inspired and provoked. Well, the, my uh, approach um, is, is through my obsessions. I, I find that my obsessions are the thing that uh, allow me to know there's something that I need to say and say again. And the more, the closer I get to the bone of that, um, for me anyway, it uh, relieves some of the obsession. Um, I'll use my father as an example. Um, my father and I initially, uh, until recently, had a, a challenging relationship. And I wrote about it a great deal. And then once that obsession, because I was quite obsessed with it, wasn't there, once uh, we uh, reconciled, right? And the obsession was gone, none of the poems carried it. There was nothing to get to. There had been some kind of resolve. So that's why I say obsessions often are the key to what I need to uh, reveal or what I need to say, um, which are basically one and the same for me, what I need to say and what I need to reveal. Um, well, what I need to say is a larger, that's the rubric, but it's definitely under it. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways I go in. So that's what I would suggest, what to be really honest about what's needling you and then to ask yourself why you haven't brought it to the poetry or what prevents bringing it directly. And, and I often tell people you don't have to publish it, but you do have to write it. So. Good advice. This question is actually for both of you from Shannon Winston. She says, I loved both talks and would be really curious to hear a, both of you comment on overlaps between the personal I and the sublime. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna start because I'm I'm, by the, the, I'm at the bit. Okay, um, I have long been fascinated by the sublime. <laughs> I just you know and and um, those who know my work know that um, one of my obsessions is ideas around beauty, um, the beauty with a capital B. Um, so. So in, in, when I'm thinking of the I, I'm thinking about possibilities for sublimity, ways of thinking of sublimity, vantages when the coming at sublimity that are limited um, by groups, particularly those inside of collective groups that don't utilize the personal I. Because I, I really think that I, I need to hear from those people. I, I need to understand it. And I also think in the sublim, I think of the sublimity of cultures and that can't happen if they're not seen. So um, I, I'm still working my way through it, as I said at the beginning of the, of the talk. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to have a conversation with you, David, down the road so I can ask you my questions. Okay, that's my answer. Oh, that's my answer too. Um, <laughs> read the question again. Would you, would you, Marcy? Yes. Um, let me grab it. I love these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, here it is. 
Um, so I, I loved both your talks. I would be really curious to hear both of you comment on overlaps between the personal I and the sublime. I am a pretty devoted disbeliever in the sublime um, and the, the prospect of the sublime. It is an ideal to me and I am not an idealist. Um, but there's another thing that I would replace um, and that is the collective rather than the sublime um, in the desire and the longing and the, the, the need for us to speak this is what Vivi's talk was about in part, um, to speak so wholly and so completely that all voices are part of that collective, but that collective is made of individual voices and always to remember both of those entities and not that one erases the other one. The thing I disbelieve about the sublime is that it intends to erase the individual. That's what it's about. It's about dying it's about stepping off the edge and you don't come back so that you can see you know essentially what god sees um and i'm not willing to make that step and therefore i'm not willing quite to believe in that ideal but i do believe in that other actuality of an ever inclusive collective made of those individual voices. That seems to me a beautiful uh, prospect. Thank you both. Uh, a sort of follow-up question for that, I think, um, David, from Gary Kay. Uh, Coleridge refers to the imagination as something like the repetition of the finite mind in the infinite I am. How might this relate to your discussion of the sublime? I don't know. <laughs> Who are these questions? <laughs> These questions are so good, they suggest to me that the person who asked this question already knows the answer that, um, that may exist there. Uh, would you read that one again, too? Yes. <laughs> uh, Coleridge refers to the imagination as something like the repetition of the finite mind in the infinite I am. How might this relate to your discussion of the sublime? I don't know. That's that sounds like Kant to me, and that also does sound to me like the the relationship between a single person and something like a collective. Um, Kant Kant called that the uh, the noble sublime. It was his way of talking about the, the you know the destination of uh, the sublime narrative where you eventually arrive. Um, how that relates to Wordsworth, I'd, I'd have to sit down with, with Tintern Abbey and look through it again uh, to be able to answer that question. Well, the sun is just blinding me all of a sudden. I'm getting a message. <laughs> <laughs> How would you answer that, Vivi? Well, it, as you were talking just now, I'm thinking, um, I think, because uh, I don't have the pages in front of me right now, I, I ended uh, section eight or section nine with the the phrase I am for a reason because that that I am I think speaks to both the personal and sublimity at, at, at that collective at one time right so as it as it relates to Wordsworth I don't I don't think I can answer that um, as it relates to Wordsworth I'd have to go back and reconsider Wordsworth I, off the top of my head, I, I don't think I can answer yeah. that. I love Wordsworth. I love Wordsworth too, and I'd have to think. I'd have to go back and look at my Coleridge as well. The 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 romantic poet that that expression connects to, for me more than either of those folks is Claire, who had a series of poems oh. called "I Am," and oh. these assertions of selfhood and 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 um I'm writing again okay yeah but but with claire again that it's it, that's very not claire is such a hands in the dirt poet um really contradictory to the sublime but that, that's how i think i would go back and begin to approach that good question you're gonna have to talk to me more about that because claire's so iconoclastic so <laughs> 
Oh, I, you know, yeah. Okay. So Claire, Claire is hard to like. Um, I, I love him more than I like him. Um, and I and I read his poems. I read the little bits and pieces of the poems rather than whole poems. They are so messy. Well, anyway, I'm I'm far afield here. No, oh, thank you both. I think I, think, I hope that was helpful to uh, Gary who asked the question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this question is for is for Vivi from Aurora Masum Javed. She says, our lives are so relational and I wonder how we, na how we navigate those who are still living, who become storied in our personal poems. How do we hold the challenge of how violence and love and care and guilt all weave as we share our work about these people with others? Aurora, hi, I'm glad you're here. Um, well, that's why I said that you don't have to publish it but you do have to write it, right? So I handle it in, in several ways and I think there are several ways to handle that. I can't say, just go ahead and write it. There aren't going to be any consequences. There will be consequences. So write, write prepared for the consequences you can bear. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote about family before my family was prepared to bear the consequences, but I was prepared to bear those consequences. I was prepared to face whatever I had to face because I had to write it. Okay? But there are other poems that I didn't uh, write until after uh, my mother's death, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So um, I've approached it several, several ways, but I'd say the, the first thing is to think it through. And also I'd say poetry is fictive. We often forget that poetry is fictive. We really don't find poetry on the memoir shelves really. Although I know hybrid verse, all of this, but in general, and if we don't allow it to be fictive, we don't allow ourselves to do things like I know my husband's done regarding me, <laughs> change the place and time. <laughs> so people won't know. You know, this time I'm like, are you really going to tell that story? And yeah, I'm going to change the place in time. I'm like, okay, that's good. That's fine. So we, we get to, um, we get to do that. And it helps and it helps protect us. So we, we want to be ever cognizant of, of our, of our safety, even as we press forward. There was, a, there was a sentence you said that was so good. I, it's still in my head, right for the consequences you can bear. Yes. I realized that's got 10 syllables. I was scanning it. That's why it, I heard <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, that's an excellent line. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions, I think. Um, so this question is for David from Christopher Miller. Um, what do you think is the place of poetry of the sublime in today's world? Of, there's cynicism and global warming and virtual reality and materialism to name a few. Um, can you talk a little more about how it might look in, for contemporary poets? Yeah, that's why I have those last entries on the, um, on the bibliography that I gave you as well. Um, uh, Ann Townsend write about, writing about the technological sublime is a terrific essay and Joy Ols, McSweeney's whole book on the necropastoral and what what those features of any writing about nature or toward nature look like after nature's dead and rotten. Um, the sublime, again, the sublime is really a feature of the early 19th century. And everything since that has to do with certain degrees of disbelief of the ideal um, romantic uh, narrative. That's how I find it interesting now, the way we might push back rather than the way we might embrace and um, believe in the sublime. But I, again, I'm such a skeptic toward all the large narratives, uh, especially the ones that, that claim ideal uh, conclusions, whether that's religion or aesthetics or um, anything. Mm -hmm. I tend to myself disbelieve. Um, I think the opportunities in describing a new sublime might have to do with physics 
and might have to do with um, technology. That's, that's an interesting, and I, I don't have the training in physics or science to, to know much about that, but that would be fascinating to explore. I think that's open territory. And appropriate for pandemic times to Absolutely. consider. Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm glad. I'm trying to write a poem about COVID and beauty. Um, that's impossible, but that's, I'm trying to. I'm trying to do that thing. I don't know how to do it, so that's why I'm doing it. You no, know, can I add to that? I'm. I'm thinking about those areas of pushback. And for me, I think one of the things I'm most drawn to right now are ideas around the non-binary. And I mean that in every way, at every level. I'm, I'm not limiting what I'm what I'm seeing as or thinking of as non-binary, just the idea because so much, I, I'm thinking of, um, I'm, I'm gonna speak from uh, the American West, not Texas, but America as a Western state, um, because that's what I, I feel like I can speak to most. Um, but moving away from binaries just explodes and implodes so many things in the best way. You know, I find myself oppressed by binaries more than anything else. Um, even, you know, in, in the, the lecture that I, I just gave, you know, I'm very cognizant that I'm speaking into that um, egregious uh, black white binary. I'm necessarily speaking into it and I'm speaking from my point of knowledge, but still um, at 57, I'll feel so released when I'm not thinking of things in binary terms. So for me, if there is any beauty, it's going to lay in that direction. Yeah, that's the destination of the sublime too. And it is in that it is the binary opposite of the real. Um, there again, that narrative itself is described by a platonic binary. You're right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it looks like we are out of time for the audience Q&A. So I know there were so many questions that we weren't able to get to, uh, but I do encourage you all to join the virtual signing, which is, will start immediately after this. You'll have a few moments with the author, uh, get your book signed and, and ask them the questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, thank you so much, Vivi and Baker, for your time, uh, for your generosity and your wisdom today. Thank you all for being here tonight, this afternoon. Um, so we'll be dropping information about the virtual signing in the chat. It is another Zoom link with breakout rooms and things like that and more instructions. So be on the lookout in the chat room. We'll get that started in a moment. Um, and just a reminder that today at four o'clock, our first uh, participant open mic uh, will happen. It's gonna be a YouTube playlist that will launch right at four. So you can subscribe to the Palm Beach Poetry Festival YouTube and uh, we'll also share links to that in the chat. Uh, and just a reminder that tonight is an event you won't want to miss. It's our uh, Thomas Lux Memorial Reading featuring Gregory Orr performing his beloved poetry and song cycle with the amazing Parkington Sisters. So music and poetry at eight o'clock tonight. And um, thank you again, Vivi and David. And thank you again to everyone um, and to Susan and Miles and all the staff. We'll see you again soon.